from back in 1938, a lady was walking home one night and she heard the sound. It's like she said it was like a bridle being whipped. And next minute she in this place and coming back to what you're saying about clothing, she said she was in this really futuristic, bright city where everyone was beautiful. And then there was, the noise came back again and she found herself three miles away from where she had experienced the, the, the first sound. So wow. it, in a lot of ways, it's a, it's a classic missing time yeah. UFO um, encounter if you want to put it, if you want to frame it in yeah. that way. And at the same time, of course, it, it's, whatever is happening is not, it's, it's, a, it's UFO are masking themselves. That story had been recorded using the context of the language people knew at the time and yet it still resonated. We can still recognize that type of story for what yeah. it was. And again, as you say, these little oddities, people dress differently. You know, it's like they don't know. You're, you're a stranger now in their, their environment. And yet you're, you're the outsider, but if they pop into ours, we can notice them. Hello and welcome to the Spirit Box podcast, where we explore folklore, magic, the world of the spirits, and everything in between. Today we welcome David Halpin, uh, David is a writer uh, from Carlo in Ireland, and, and he has a deep knowledge and, and expertise in Ireland's fairy lore and its pagan heritage. On his Facebook blog, Circle Stories, he explores these themes in great depth, and we'll have the link to that in the show notes, so do do go give that a follow. David is also the creative force behind the Occult Book Review, both on Twitter and on the YouTubes. Now, one of the things I really love about David's work is he's an active participant in preserving the lore and mythology of Ireland. He goes out and sees the stones, the fairy forts, and he teases their stories from them. Stories of celestial alignments, stories of folkloric importance of people's experiences throughout the generations at these places. And I think that's amazing. I think it's vital, you know, for people like ourselves, uh, myself and yourself, dear listener, who are drawn to these areas um the work of people like david uh, is what makes an awful lot of our research possible um so anyway this is a really interesting show and it's it's one that was on the cards for a long time and um i'm glad we've finally managed to to make it happen so so in the show uh, david talks about how he looks uh, for the attributes and the themes that um forms exhibit you know that, that they can manifest in the in the same ways um and he talks specifically th- about this uh, in terms of the banshee which kind of gets the show on the road and he pulls various examples from memory from Ducas, um the irish schools collection and other sources um that that he's managed to collect over time we go through the parallels with ufos we get into the are there differences between cities and rural areas in terms of fairies? Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. And we go down a bit of a rabbit hole after the old puka. We get into the power of reversals and how that seems to be a really, um, really a, a, a thread that goes through a hell of a lot of fairy lore. In the Plus Show, we get into the dangers of summoning the good people and why, uh, why David used the, the term senubites to describe the fairies in, in his recent appearance in What Magic Is This? And David regales us with a story of rushing up against the strange when uh, on a remote trip to a, to a stone circle, which, uh, which really, really made me laugh. And we also discussed uh, the nature of fairy ointments and from there discussed the potential use of, of, of um, native psychedelics in... Well, evidence in, in Irish mythology and perhaps uh, folk practice. And we go off in a couple of interesting tangents on the jinn, uh, Our Lady of Fatima, and the, the very nature of consciousness. So it's, a, it's a, a fun show and one I really enjoyed. I'm also putting into the Plus Show, I'm putting in an account of Witnessing the Banshee from season one of the show. I've put that into the end. And do... Um, do hang about for that because it's it's a fun one. It's an interesting one, and it highlights some of the things that David and I discussed during the podcast. So there's loads of show notes for this one. So if anything uh, piques your interest during the show, then do check out the the show notes because there's probably a link to it. Um, and if you want to hear the plus show, then 
go scroll down through these amazing show notes and um, there you'll see the link to my link three and you can find the link to my Patreon and come and join the fam. There's a hell of a lot in there. There's their entire back catalogue of plus shows and heaps and heaps of bonus stuff. So if that sounds like your bag, then do give it a shot. Right, that's it from me. Let's get on with the show. Very, very happy and um I'm waiting a very long time to, to welcome David Halpin onto the show. David, it's fantastic to have you onto the show. Cheers, Dara. It's great to be here. And I uh, loved all the previous episodes of Spirit Box, so it's great to be on the show as well with all the great guests you've had on in the past and to talk ah. to yourself, of course. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> well, it's lovely to have you on the show. Do you know, I actually, I, I'd... um. I thought about kind of introducing you in Irish and then I, I completely forgot about that. So that's... um. Bit of a disappointment uh, to myself. My Irish is, is, is awful anyway. So uh, oh, well, mine's not great either, you know. But so yeah, yeah, yeah. we've been good. I've, I've, ju- I've just seen my daughter's uh, Christmas report, so it runs in the family. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've um I've spent one of the kind of I do annual goals, you know, and, and some of which uh, uh I do well, but others I don't. But I find it very helpful to track the year. And then one of the things I've been looking at is um really uh, reevaluating my Irish you know, uh, I'm working at it again. And um, one of the things that I found really, uh, I don't know, um, really lovely is the, is the name for animals, the name for wildlife in Irish. There's so many beautiful names um, for for uh, various different forms of life in Irish that you just don't get the same impact in, 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 in English. Um, uh, and it makes me think an awful lot about kind of like, you know, the areas that you're interested in and you've got expertise in around kind of folklore and fairy lore and all that kind of thing. When you, when you look at how, what the words mean specifically in Irish and then how they became anglicized, you know, there's a lot of them. Yeah. Cost. Have you read uh, the, the Mancon Magan book? Uh, uh, he has a couple out now, actually. So if you haven't, does. you might, you might find them he really does. interesting. He content. does. I, then, the new one is actually um, uh, the gentleman who does the illustration um, uh, uh, listens to the show. So oh, uh, right, okay. he, he's very kindly uh, going to send me uh, a new one about, uh, it's about the mythical creatures of Ireland. Isn't it it is, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and all, of the, all of the sacred places. And, yeah. uh, you know, I guess it covers all of the supernatural folk yeah. as well. But, but yeah. the one previous to that was about the Irish words and where they came from. And again, like like the, the beauty of, of the words yeah. themselves. And yeah. oddly enough, there was a book a couple of years ago um, about that as well, the way words were, are disappearing from yeah. the language and they're being replaced by, it's almost like a Gnostic or, or, or arcanistic uh, takeover really? of language itself, yeah. which is interesting, but it's a bit of a diversion in terms That's of what we're talking about now. Yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Uh, and like the, the the ones that I was kind of picking up on are, are like the fairly standard ones, like but you know, um, like wolf is like mock tear, like 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 son of the land, and mm-hmm. that, and then the the, the lovely one for um, uh, for ladybirds as a boeing deer, a boeing okay. good deer, like the like the little cow of yeah. God, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which are charming. Um, but uh, that's a bit I kind of wanted to ask you about in in terms of kind of the like. The, the depth of, of um like fairy lore that you have um knowledge in is is there any of those areas where kind of like i mean as i said neither of us are our gaelic scholars like you know we're we're yeah we're picking up our cupola focal um um that'll probably get me caught now on the youtube swear filters now but uh yeah yeah well, i'm well, actually under pressure now because my wife has taken it up again and she has a <laughs> right right and yeah she's, she's learning irish yeah um but in in some of the lore and in some of the kind of the, the but in in some of the the lore that you look at, um, is there any areas where you found just having that little bit of understanding some of the words makes a difference? I mean, like banshee is the obvious one, you know. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Like the, I, the you know what? Like, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I think for me, I, I'm not that type of a thinker or or a writer or researcher right. what I'm, I'm interested in are the stories themselves and what i pick up on and which has been said to me before is is the, the are the motifs and the way you can compare 
certain figures, even if the names are different or if the name is the same. The attributes of these forms can uh, manifest in the same way. Yeah. Uh, like, I, I remember a while ago, my wife had a gig in Roscommon and we had to drive from Carlo to Roscommon to get there. It was, I think, almost three hours. And I remember thinking as we were driving, all of this land is so, Ireland is a small country. And yet, a few thousand, thousand years ago, this was all deeply forested. There were people who could probably live in their own little enclosed tribal area without ever encountering any other people. Yeah. And so within that context, then, what's interesting is from all of Ireland, you, you get these stories that are carried on in oral tradition of these forms and yet they still have the same ways of manifest manifesting you know they they come with with lights they move on lights they they move like with with a fairy wind or they they ask for certain things so for me that's what what's interesting to pick up on and even if the names are different say for example the banshee as you mentioned there would both be known as the bab or even the bow, that, that kind of anglicized version in Wexford, but it's still the banshee, you know. Yeah. And as time as time changes and language changes, the, the persona and the traits of these forms still stay the same, even if how we dress them changes, you know. So I find that interesting, and, and I think that that also adds to the the mystery of the authenticity as well. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I really get that. You know, um, I can see like, I mean, you're, you're one of the, you're one of the few people who've read my, my book, um, kind of already. So for those who don't know, David was my Irish folklore stress test. I was like, if I can get past him, then I know it's, I'm not completely full of shit. So, uh, it's, it's a brilliant book and I can't yeah. wait for everyone else to read it. Sarah. Oh, that's really kind of you. That's really kind of you. Fantastic work. But that, that was kind of where I picked up on like the, like when I saw the Far Dark in the, in the kind of the, yeah, yeah, in the, in the, in the Fianna stuff. Um, and it's really startling when you, when you pick up those motifs, you know, when you think about kind of like so much of our folklore across the world has been, divided by not just geography but, but language and culture and then when you're able to kind of boil it down to the nub and you start seeing so many of these repetitive um mo- motifs it's it's staggering you know yeah yeah it's just kind of cutting uh, it, it's just this endless kind of repetition in, in so many ways of, of human experiences but also kind of human experiences with the other um and um yeah, in, in hearing those kind of different versions of, of, of the Banshee and kind of different, I know you, you recently wrote a, a piece about that. I've been following, uh, I follow you on Insta because I'm, I'm not on Facebook because I'm a crotchety old man. Right, right. But, but um, that's one of the re- one of the only reasons that um, I'm, that I, I actually regret Facebook is, is your <laughs> well, because I always, you know what, like, yeah, yeah. I did, it, it's odd, like I didn't intend on staying yeah. on Facebook or making that the platform, but it's just, one that happened to take off and yeah. there are so many people there now who I interact with yeah. and the, the problem for me and it's a good problem is that the, the articles get shared so widely yeah. that I can't I can't even keep up with yeah. commenting or answering questions on other platforms but at least with Facebook yeah. it's yeah. like I like I, I am there and people can, yeah. can interact yeah. I can interact with people so it's, it's just worked out like that, you know, yeah, sure, sure. one of those things. Yeah. Well, but, um, do you know what, Dar, just as an aside, can you hire up your mic a little bit? Is yeah, that possible? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? But is it, can you hear me better now? Yeah, a little bit better. Cool. That's, yeah. that's okay. okay. Um, but, um, yes, uh, I've written a few pieces about, about the Banshee. Uh, yeah. An interesting one read, read, um, was after I had read uh, Joshua's book, um, e- 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 Ecology of Souls. Yeah, which which I think you think you've read yourself. Um, there was there was an interesting story around this area about a lady in white who guards a, a, a colleen, and a colleen for people who don't know is a place where unbaptized children were were buried, and often it was strangers to to the area, or maybe a criminal, people who who weren't allowed on, on the sanctified ground. Right, and oftentimes these places were also the the local fairy rat or fairy fort. 
So there was an association for the for the the parents. They could place a, a child with the fairy. So if the fairies were seen as beings or forms who were uh, not good enough for heaven, not evil enough for hell, the children were, were placed in this liminal space. Okay, where the parents could have some kind of consolation in that that their their, their child was somewhere and being looked after. But anyway, coming back to this local story of a lady in white who was known more as a ghost or a banshee, um, I kind of thought it was interesting that she appeared at a Killeen and it was a different attribute to if if we want to classify her as a banshee. It's a totally different a- a- attribute, almost like a psychopomp. You know, like she's guarding yeah. the, the, the souls of these children. Yeah. But from that perspective, why I was interested was because it kind of dawned on me then that it's us who are placing the the modus operandi on these forms, it's us yeah. who are categorizing them. But really, we could be completely wrong. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, yeah. So from that perspective, I was interested in what Joshua had written as well, and because he his book is so it has so many different stories and so many mm. different perspectives and fantastic work. But just when I was thinking about the banshee, I was like, "Yeah, like if this if this form is a banshee, like it's it's something that we don't normally think of banshees as doing, as, um, you know, being psychopaths. Instead, they're they're people who warn about deaths. Uh, they may place a curse on a family. Uh, yeah. They're out, out, outside time in a way because they tend to be able to speak about what's going to happen to a generation in the future, as well as the present. And I find that that as I've written about before, it's almost like a quantum aspect, mm. you know, because they're outside of our, our everyday perception and our everyday experience of time. And yet, they, they seem to have no problem moving dimensionally in that way. So, that and of course, <laughs> yeah, but like, you know, but that's, that's just a different context for the Banshee, which they, I, I find interesting to contemplate. Mm. And uh, when you cross that with the fact that they often appear in archaic looking clothing, you know, yeah. it's just another yeah. area of strangeness. And that that motivation thing is is a question that I, 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 I you know, obviously you can tie yourself in knots with it, you know, and, and I quite frequently do. But but it, it the the thing of like the the weird clothing or the out of time clothing always kind of fascinates me because it you now this could be off just pure it's, it's pure assumption that's me projecting i suppose as well mm-hmm. but, but it hints at a similar lack of understanding of us because if if something yeah, is yeah. materializing and manifesting like what's a hundred years you know yeah like yeah. five years in fashion now you know it is looks totally different you know yeah yeah you know as a gen I, xer I, seeing millenn- millennials in skinny jeans <laughs> oh, still hurts. Yeah, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, there, there's a, another story from around here which appears on the Duke. So when I say from around here, I should say like I, where I live. I live on the, the Wicklow Carlow border, and it's an area where we have uh, we're lucky, very lucky to still have lots of stone circles, lots yeah. of fairy forts. And um, I've been involved in a few campaigns to try to preserve them and to stop uh, development in these areas. Why people would want to uh, it's, kind it's of dark. knock down a the stone circle or dolmen or you know it's, it's, it's progress we're told but really it's shocking yeah. what can be done we had a near miss recently where there was supposed to be a wind farm erected next to a stone circle yeah. and it would block out an alignment from Cadeen Mountain down to Bowley Carrageen which has existed for over 5,000 years now luckily enough the, in the end the, the planning was rejected but it's an ongoing battle to right. try and preserve this type of heritage yeah but anyway, coming back to that that story, on that particular mountain, Cadine, we have lots and lots of stories about fairies, uh, people going missing, missing time, lots, lots of really interesting motifs and parallels to, to UFO uh, lore and uh, occurrences as well. But this one back in 1938, a lady was walking home one night and she heard the sound it's like she said it was like a bridle being whipped and next minute she's in this place and coming back to what you're saying about clothing she said she was in this really futuristic bright city where everyone was beautiful and then there was the noise came back again and she found herself three miles away from where she had 
experience the, the, the first sound. So wow. in a lot of ways, it's a, it's a classic missing time yeah. UFO um, encounter, if you want to put it, if you want to frame it in yeah. that way. And at the same time, of course, it's, whatever is happening is not. It's, it's, it's a the UFO are masking themselves. Story had been recorded using the context of the language people knew at the time, and yet it still resonated. We can still recognize that type of story for what yeah. it was. And again, as you say, these little oddities, people dress differently. You know, it's like they don't know you're you're a stranger now in their their environment. And yet you're you're the outsider. But if they pop into ours, we can mm. notice those, those yeah. weird traits. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 so interesting, and it does. Yeah, I mean, I think what you were saying there about existing outside of time um, makes an awful lot of sense. Or indeed, like from from a jinn perspective. Uh, from sorry, from from a kind of an Arabic perspective, the idea of jinn having like these extraordinarily long lifetimes, um, kind of hint to the same thing, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's fascinating stuff. Um, in t- in terms of kind of like the the areas of interest, you know, what's the kind of most say recent story coming out of Ireland that has piqued your interest? Recent account. Well, I I get stories all of the time, and it, it's difficult not to be a judge sometimes, <laughs> you know, because you'll go, oh, that's, that's, that's not true, or that's, yeah. you know, it's a, just a generic tale, or this, that, or the other. And, uh, like, I wrote about that at one point, and what I found was, and I, I will answer your question, but I'll just take a, take a kind of a, a scenic route, if you don't mind. Of course. What I, what I was writing about was the pressure people are under to conform to previous fairy types in yeah. Ireland because they don't want to say something that's too, which has, which has too much uh, peripheral strangeness first and foremost, but which they won't be able to explain to people. And so they sometimes will go, yeah, okay, then like, well, I suppose it was like this. I suppose it was like that, whereas the initial description is something completely different. And again, it comes to, down to us classifying or wanting to compartmentalize yeah. these forms so that we can, we can track them and we can say, okay, this particular fairy is seen here in a woodland area, this one or wherever it is beside water, or this one here only comes when it's the equinox. Whereas, in fact, if you go a little bit beyond that, perhaps it's us placing those restrictions on these forms and they're as unaware of these categories as um, as, as we would be if we were in their world and we were trying to make sense of it. So, like, I think people are, we were speaking about the Banshee already, so Banshee, I get stories about the Banshee quite a lot sent in. I get odd, odd stories. One I mentioned to Douglas before was about this guy who saw this joint uh, skin, this rabbit, and he chased it through the field. And after after he chased it through the field, he happened to look up to the sky and he realized that he didn't recognize any of the constellations. And then after wow. that, he kind of was a bit bewildered and suddenly something happened and reality seemed to shift again. And he was back in the normal world again. And it was a bit like um, the Jenny Randall thing, the Oz effect, where people can be outside of time, outside of dimensional time and outside of linear time as well, when they have, these types of experiences. Yeah. So, so that 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 was one that stood out for me simply because of that, because I was interested in it. Um, there is a science fiction book from the early two thousands called Eiffelheim, actually, and it reminded me a bit of that because it's it's about this uh, space alien spacecraft which crashes in medieval Germany. So it was a really unusual setting, which was why it was, it, I remember this. But there's one point where the alien is looking up at the sky and. The alien realizes that not only are they so far from home, but they're in a totally different dimension as well, and they will have no hope of ever returning to their own world. It was a kind of a, a poignant moment. But I, I wonder, with so-called uh, time slips and with fairy encounters, which, which have that uh, it, it, a way of placing you outside of the everyday world, with the fairy mist, for example, mm. are we also trespassing almost or, or slipping into some kind of uh, 
part of our own world which we normally wouldn't perceive and are there reasons for that perhaps maybe that morning we've done something you know that affected our metabolism which allowed us to just experience something outside of our normal everyday senses or is it something else entirely i don't yeah. really know but um i think everyone is bewildered and often confused and sometimes scared when they do have these experiences so i find sometimes people have a lot of trepidation and they tend to wait to see what your reaction is before they tell you the next part, which would be something more sensational maybe or intimate. And they would be reluctant to disclose that, you know, because oftentimes there's a, a sexual element of fairy accounts, which you don't, you don't see that part in the Dukas archives, for example. In fact, there's, there's, there's very little of dark folklore yeah. In, in Duke. And I'm not saying sex is, is, is dark, but people weren't, well, for some people. But uh, for what it is, people would not have disclosed that. Yeah. In the environment where people were giving out uh, their, their tales, it would be to their neighbor or maybe someone who came to, to, to visit the, the, the village or for the school's collection. It was to like the kids in the village. So they're not going to tell them a story about how they were, you know, aroused or something more explicit in yeah. the context of fairy lore and yes in european fairy lore and in Abor a lot of aboriginal lore i find those things there's not as much of a taboo yeah. about speaking about those aspects you know so I, like i i do think we're, we're missing a, a part of our own folklore which maybe with our you know where we're more open today you might argue so perhaps that aspect will start to come into it yeah yeah and, and, and you know and, and we're missing like we're we're missing big sections of history uh, you know where we don't have as you said those those explicit accounts captured in in kind of any other formal ways either like you know that a lot of that stuff turns up in the scottish witch trials you know mm -hmm. what i would term you know fairly experiences and um being like hypersexual so like, like for example yeah. The case of like Andrew Mann, um, he explicitly said he had like several barns, as the mm -hmm. uh, the Northies yeah, like to say, yeah. um, with with the Queen of Elfheim, you yeah, know. Yeah. So yeah. like it's and and that is in those like court records, whereas we didn't really yeah, have witch yeah. trials here, you know, that didn't really happen. Yeah, yeah, and, and unfortunately during the Civil War, yeah. we we lost a, an awful lot of documentation anyway. Yeah. So perhaps yeah. there were there were accounts that are not necessarily witch trials but yeah. you know the documentation like that you know where yeah. you would pick up on certain uh stories that would have been sensational at the time well yeah that's bad but we yeah, can't get those back yeah unfortunately that's the way it is right um yeah. um so in so in terms of 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 um like the more kind of interesting recent stories you're saying to you you are there are bits coming up that do have that kind of more dark sexual bend to them. Um, you know what? It, it, it's interesting because I think people who are interested in the occult and interested in witchcraft and within Ireland's pagan community, which is very diverse now, um, perhaps people are more open and they're saying things. Or maybe it's just the circle that I move in and that I'm getting to hear about these types of stories. Often um, there may be a ritual element, so there, 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 there could be some kind of uh, initiatory taboo where people can't talk about what happened. Yeah. But they, they, they will hint at it, you know. Like I certainly I know a lot of people who um, would perform rituals and who would say, this happened or that happened, but I can't write about. It. So, are are people just encountering what people have always encountered, but couldn't disclose? Um, there's certainly a bit of a taboo about speaking about fairy encounters in general, not even from a, a, a sexual point of view or from some kind of dark magic where they had to use a piece of a corpse. Or something like it. Like, you now, there are the odd stories in Dukas. There is a particular story where a fairy instructs someone to 
dig up a corpse and use the hand. So, you know, no, the dead hand. Like, I was surprised to find those types of stories in the archive. And using the, using the hand for things to either uh, make your neighbor's butter go bad, you know, or even to break into houses. So that that is interesting that that bypassed the, the type of self-censorship that we had. But I suppose in other ways, there was almost, I, I don't know if you find this, Dara, but the, the, the Irish humour is quite dark as well. So there are toothache remedies where you dig up a, a corpse and take the skull and rub the, the corpses the, the, the skull tooth against your tooth and those kind of things are in and there's that's a really dark thing and yet it's almost humorously thrown in you know so it may, yeah. maybe that, that's an Irish characteristic though. I mean talking shit is one of our yeah <laughs> one of our cultural yeah yeah, yeah 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 <laughs> um, there was a there was an interesting um, a show we did a, a couple of years back uh, called um, the Spansel of Death. Yes, I remember that one. That was a very, yeah. very good show. That was the, the the girl whose uncle, I think, our great uncle, had written the play. Was that right? That's right. It, yeah. And it was it was only in the Abbey, and then it didn't go ahead because the the rising took place. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Good, mem- good memory on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, that's exactly it. And then that was uh, that was an interesting one because like um, it like. Total black magic in that one. Yeah, yeah. Like digging up a corpse and taking it a making it a ring of 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 skin, cutting it out so it came off as a perfect ring, and then wearing it about one's waist for the rest of your life. Yeah, yeah. And and the, and the thing is, of course, that spell did not just exist in isolation. Isolation. Yeah. It didn't pop out of nowhere. Yeah. That, that was obviously part of a lexicon of spells that we we perhaps uh, I don't know we, we didn't write about and still exist or else it was just something that uh, um, again initiation uh, witchcraft lines and so on you get a lot of people saying that they're part of um, a tradition that's been going back hundreds of thousands of years at least these people will say that say that to me and yeah. maybe, maybe they are and so they're going to have access to to yeah. spells like that, which are which are very dark, but it, it, that that puts me in mind of uh, the idea of bloodletting as well, which which again existed and it, it managed to, to get through Ducas archive as well. So that there are accounts of people drinking blood on certain days, drink mixing it with milk, um, for protection, for fairy yeah. protection. But then there's also an interesting story of a woman who was washing her sheets and she she put them on the fairy fort to dry and when she came back the next day they were sprinkled in blood and after that she she got really sick and died herself and then later she was seen at the fairy fort as a ghost in the company of the fairies so i always find that a really interesting account because it has a, a number of interpretations but or or avenues that you can go down but first of all like did the fairies poison her? Did they put contaminated blood on her sheets? Mm-hmm. Was her transgression really that bad? Like mm-hmm. put her sheets on the fairy trees at the fort to dry? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't seem to be too too uh, too bad a thing to do. But then afterwards, of course, when she's dead, to be seen in their company. So it's not even like was the blood used to initiate a transformation from the human world and allow her access. <laughs> to yeah. the fairy world because you do have that lim- liminal area where it's like are they a ghost or are they human or have they been transported to something in be- a place in between and it's it's an interesting one to contemplate for all of those reasons but it also strikes me as one that's a good example of how baffling sometimes the actions of fairies are to us because yeah. we can't we can't really make sense of that we're like well like why why would you do that to this person but again their motivations might be completely different and it's you know you'll, you'll spend your whole life trying to find the answers to to these stories and, and yeah you won't do it in the end mm-hmm. yeah and yeah <laughs> You know, I I love these stories. They're they're so fascinating, and and they they really, they really bring me home. You know, um, 
they bring me home in a, in a, in a, in a kind of very rural way. Um, well, obviously enough, but, but the, the reason I'm making this meandering lead <laughs> into the question is, is like, you're very close to, to so many people that have a, a experiences and you're, you're an authority in, in, in this area. Like, I've rarely heard of like fairy encounters in cities and towns. Like they always seem to be confined to kind of rural spaces. You know, when I think of a fairy landscape, I have a very, very clear one in my head. You know, um, what's your what's your thoughts on that? Is it, I know you get you get things like brownies, like house fairies. Yeah, yeah. You know, the dobbies of this world. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know? um, it's an interesting one to ponder because I mean we're. we're we're approaching a point now where we have so many cities and they've encroached on so much of yeah. um, previously wild landscapes. So perhaps the the, the apparent um, disparity there is simply due to that and it won't matter once once the city's expanding up and towns expanding yeah. up, you'll find that the, the, the encounters continue. So there is that, but there is also, the, there are a lot of, accounts in Dublin City as well, for example, back in the 30s. Like, if, if there's a few um, podcasts uh, from the National Folklore Archives where they talk about people living in, in, the, in the tenements, yeah. throwing out their, their wastewater, and they would have to call out or whistle in case the fairies were going by. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's because they didn't want to offend them. So there was that knowledge mm. of fairies and the belief that they could still be existing in that urban environment as well as the, the rural areas. But I, I agree with you as well because there, there certainly does seem to be an easier um, access point in wilderness than than a city. Um, whether that's to do it, you know, the, the very, very basic thing of being more grounded and being in a natural environment because some people would see fairies as very much that type of uh, woodland spirit yeah. type of uh, almost um, a, a Steiner like form and others then would, would disagree completely with that as well and so for me living where I live certainly I strongly associate very with the, 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 the wilder parts of the land if I'm going to a stone circle or whatever or I'm going on a hike up the mountain I'll almost bypass like the, the parts of the town which are built up and I'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when I stop the car and get about a mile into the woodlands, then I kind of go, okay, now I'm out into into the wild where things may happen. Or, you know, I can get yeah. a sense of what it was like for people back in the day. Or, you know, I can focus more upon a story I might be researching and I feel it's more authentic there. But there might, there might be a bias on my part Certainly, uh, Fritz Lieber, this, the, he was a science fiction writer, but he also wrote about folklore in that context. And he said, he had a term for it, it escapes me at the moment, but he said that everything eventually becomes haunted. And he, mm. he said, look, it doesn't matter, he said, whether you're, you're moving to a city to escape the, 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 the goblins and ghouls, eventually <laughs> they, they, and yeah. go, they, they'll come into you in the city as well. So who knows? Yeah, yeah, I, I find it, I find it very intriguing, you know, uh, and it's, it, it's one of those things that, like, like I mean, I, I, I live fairly close to, well, in, in a global sense, I feel I live close to London, um, but, you know, that's one of the kind of major ma- magical cities of the world, um, but it, it's, you know, where, where stuff kind of kicks off for me, or where I feel things happening. Um, it, it tends to be rural, you know. Um, yeah, you know, but I don't, you know, I kind of have an idea of what um, I'm picking up or sensing, you know. Like, um, it, yeah, and it's not ghosts, you know. Like, mm-hmm. um, and yet where I live is a very, very old place, you know. Like, it's over; it's been inhabited for over a thousand years, um, and. Uh, it's it's got its it's it's uh it's got its stories of of um local witches and murderers strung up in in gibbets and all that kind of stuff um mm-hmm. 
But my sense is that there is, I think you can pick up on the type of entities or intelligences that fairies may or may not be Mm -hmm. seem to be connected with landscape in a different way than they are to to cities. Um, And I, you know, that's not to say that there are the cities don't have their own kind of guardians and all that kind of stuff. I'm just not, I'm not that versed and I don't, I don't really know, but, but, um, the fairy energy, like if you think about kind of like the the descriptions of like things that are associated with fairies, like they're all like they're all naturally occurring things. You know, it's like it's it's all it's the, it's the blackthorn tree or it's the arch of of blackberries. It's you know the, it's the certain trees you don't touch. It's the ring of stones, the ring of mushrooms. You know, it's not the yeah. ring. Of, it's, you know, it's not the ring of of kind of. Yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, I think that's that's still the case. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been to At Greeny Stone Circle, no. um, which is quite near me. But uh, there's a the Hawth- Hawthorn tree there, and it's right. strongly associated as like a, a portal, a portal yeah. tree as well. Yeah. You know, and these stories have existed like for hundreds of years, maybe maybe <laughs> maybe much longer. Uh, at Green- was mapped out by a, a lady called Helen O'Cleary back in the seventies and early eighties, with right. um with with Dunsink Observatory helping her and her son who was um, an, an engineer. And basically, what she done was she mapped out and she showed that the whole zodiac was was encoded with within the circle. Now, wow! Some people think that her calculations may not be entirely correct, but what we do know is that the, the the solstices and equinoxes are so from that of course you can get a full cycle of the year anyway yeah. so i i don't i i, I don't disbelieve that that, that her, her calculations are um are, are are correct but um what's interesting there is we were right talking about this uh who was i talking to about this i can't remember anyway the the point was that at certain times of the year are certain fairies more strongly associated with places and you can just take a cursory look through Ducas or whatever and then you find that oh yeah there are certain fairies that pop up in in the summertime in the solstice for example the Amadon who is supposed to be the worst fairy to encounter because the Amadon is one you know yourself yeah. um, it has these this dual aspect and the Amadon even bit early apparently wasn't able to cure the stroke from the Amadon oh, wow. because it was it, it was so strong and so uh, and it's so powerful. So the Amadon is strongly associated with with June, which from a zodiac point of view is the, the sign of Gemini. So it's interesting to look at that dual dualistic nature. Is that a remnant of previous knowledge just just bleeding into the fairy lore, or or is it is it li- literally true? You may encounter the Amadon and be okay, or you may yeah. encounter the Amadon and end up. You know, insane. And yeah. then there are other fairies that are associated with the arrival of certain flowers and plants. So uh, with, with bluebells, for example, there there are fairies dressed in white who appeared at um, Rathbilly Moat, for example. And Rathbilly Moat is is an ancient structure which again was has um, particular ages built upon it, but. These fairies called to a house of someone who had picked blueberries and they, they, they knocked on the door and they were dressed all in white and they, they looked like normal human beings and they said, you're not to take the bluebells anymore, they belong to us. So they were associated with that particular flower. And then, of course, there's fairies that are associated with daffodils and, again, the hawthorn tree. So coming back to your point, you have all of these links to nature, but you don't have the same links to urban environments yet. But may, maybe at some point that yeah. will change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe it will change. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, so one one fairy that I really want to get your opinion on is is the 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 puka. And um, it, I've been kind of, I've got, I think I've got like something brewing in my head about kind of um that this might be kind of been my next rabbit hole to fall down to. Okay. Um, and it it kind of it started with. It started with kind of like the 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 puck fair 
and kind of all the kind of etymological links with the word puka, book, and almost every northwestern country in Europe has a variant of that word, which means a similar thing. Yeah, which is yeah. Somewhere between goat, somewhere between fairy, it all means trickster, you know. Um, and what I found really fascinated me is that you've got this time period from basically like Lunasa through to the Epiphany, you know, which would be in a, a week or so or just over a week, um, where you've got characters across uh, in fo- folkloric celebrations uh, across uh, Northwestern Europe and some parts of Central Europe where you have something akin to how the the puka or the uh yeah how the, how the puka is described right it's still like a, a wild thing sometimes like a, with a horse's head sometimes with horns sometimes like a, a giant rabbit all that kind of stuff yeah yeah um, what? Did, did, did you see that statue that would there was uproar over it um, the big horse's head thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. sorry, it was sculpture, not not, not a yeah. statue, but it was upright. But I thought it was really, really physical and very yeah. much uh, archaic. You know, if you know, like if you were going to imagine a puka would be that kind of uh, creature with with danger attached to it. And I you can know? tell you, if I saw that on the road, I would absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah, it yeah, would have yeah. the desired effect, no doubt about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you should, you should see what comes out of the local pub here at 12 o'clock at night. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so you have, so if, like, say if we started at like, started at the Puck Fair, um, yeah. and Kerry, and you have all the kind of the, the, the wonderful, uh, I mean, I, I, when I often describe this to kind of locals here in England or, or friends, and you know, if not from Ireland, they're like, hang on, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're like, yeah. No, we marry a wild goat to a 13 year old girl. Yeah, 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 you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and all the wonderful stuff that goes along with that, when you know, the crowning of the of King Puck, uh, and like, you know, there's a, there's a, there's an undercurrent of a, there's a covenant there being made between the locals and the wild. You know, yeah, there's, a, yeah. there's a covenant be made, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. And then you go across to um, Central Europe and, and, and Germany and Austria, and you've got Krampus, you know, and yeah, Krampus is yeah. like the, the reverse of, of, um, of Santa Claus, right? And he comes and, you know, takes the bad children away, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then I found out about a um, figure in, in Finland uh, called. Um, a uh, nutty pukki, or yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, I've been emphasizing okay. <laughs> basically. I, I'm a, one of my best friends from Finland, and okay. um, I find the Finnish language like in a deeply, deeply childish way very funny. Just to, yeah, to, yeah, yeah. it's all like you know, it's bumpy, it's a bumpy language. There's, there's lots of clicks and whistles in there, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's a, a like a, a human type wild man who's got horns, right? You know, yeah, so it's yeah. And this is, um, I think it's uh, it's around Epiphany, uh, Saint Nuts Day. So N- Nutty Pucky is like Nuts Goat, right? Yeah, I think yeah, it's yeah. Goat, some of that. But it happens around Saint Nuts Day in, in, in Finland, which is around the Epiphany. So you got this whole period from like Lunasa through to Epiphany where you've got these wild kind of wild man figures, right? Yeah. Who seem yeah. to be kind of tied to goats in some description. They all have this, this, Ethnological connection to Buka or Buka variant of it, and Buka yeah. being Buka being the kind of Buka do the, the 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 Cornish equivalent of this mm-hmm. um, this spirit, um, and they all have this reversal happening. So it's like yeah, you know, yeah. the Krampus is the reverse of Santa, um, the, the the wild goat is the crown king. It's a reversal of the roles in civilization, and and the the the, the nudie Pucky is is like playing tricks. Know to enter the house, yeah, like yeah, yeah. the the Mary Lewis Wales, right? So it's plain tricks. You have to sing a song to come out and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. And we have all these costumes, like the the Ren boys, Straw boys. So the same stuff in some way happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Across yeah. this longer time period, um, and I'm absolutely fascinated by that, you know, and fascinated kind of like how the kind of similar kind of mischievous traits are, are exhibited. Yeah, do, do you know what? No, what's interesting there, but um. I, I live 
close to uh, Pula Fuca. Have you heard? Do you know Pula ah. Fuca in, in Wicklow? So, so Pula Fuca is Pool yeah. of the Fuca. Yeah. And before Blessington Lakes were created, they were created artificially back in 1947. It, right. it was finished in, finished in 1950. So basically they flooded the entire Lippy Valley there right. and created these lakes. But before Blessington Lakes was, what was there, there was a place called the Pool of Fuca and it was a pool associated with this fairy being. Yeah. And I was I was interested to to, to to try and find out what kind of stories were there before this place was gone. Now if you go onto the National Monuments database and you go over Blessington Lakes on the map, you can see all the red dots where there were ancient structures right. that are now submerged beneath the water, which is which is sad, but at least yeah. we have some kind of record of them. And I so I, I was like, okay, yeah, it was a place strongly associated with with ancient monuments. But then I would like check the Ducas archives again, and then there were stories about the particular puka who would change into a rabbit. Sometimes he would pretend to be, be a school teacher. So when you're talking about that trickster element, and the, when I say trickster, I don't just mean something you can't understand, but to actually uh, almost subvert the mm. local population like what what better way to do it to become the school teacher and then turn into the rabbit when people find out about you and then yeah. run across the hills with everyone shooting after you you know yeah. so you have that you have that leftover uh, archetype and the puka in Blessington manifests as oddly enough okay so I mentioned the rabbit but there are also stories of it being a black cat there are also stories oh, of really? it being a black being a horse and which which is actually quite common because uh, yeah. close by here is uh, the what's called the ring of the rat which is this uh, bronze age fort and then it became, then a later medieval enclosure and one of the stories associated with the ring of the rat is that a person was taken for three days by the puka and the puka he thought he was only gone for three hours with this missing time yeah. uh, my motif is quite common with, with fairy encounters as well so he was taken by the, by the black horse. He thought he was being uh, taken away for three hours and he came back so it was later, three days later or something like that. Right. So that's interesting as well because the puka, there doesn't seem to be a definitive way to pin it down. And I guess that's part of its nature. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. you know, like that, that idea of reversal is in itself, throwing it back on you and reflecting Mm. what you want to see in a way you, you, you might argue but there's also an interesting way of looking at it because with the puka being associated with the winter the winter was the wildest time that, and the time where you were in danger and where nature might kill you anyway because of whether it was starvation or cold yeah. so it's interesting to have that figure associated with, with, with the elements and there are also parallels there to the Calic as well. Yeah, lots yeah. of the, the 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 women, fairy type uh, supernatural figures associated with this time of year, Lebafana, um, Petra, and so on. So and, and Holda. So these are all women representing the winter in a way, but at the same time, there's there's more to to them than that because they all have their own supernatural attributes and their own motivation. Yeah, just like the puka has it's just trying to get a pin on it is it's very difficult yeah yeah no it really is um and i i, I think what what really fast I, i'm so glad you picked up on that a bit there because that's a bit i forgot about like um how so many geographical places are named after this 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 particular like spirit or archetype whatever whatever it is it's like this everywhere like yeah, it's all yeah. over the place here as well and like yeah. in, in the uk you come up with like you know puck lane and like um uh, and the, the or pook lane these kind of things like it just comes up again and again it's absolutely fascinating mm -hmm. yeah and um, it shows it shows the connect con connection that was there between the everyday world and the supernatural world and how yeah. pervasive it yeah. was to have to have all these places named named after these figures it's like what we were speaking about at the start um, where I was saying traveling through Ireland and you see how people could live in isolation and yet they still came up with figures who may may have had different names sometimes but at the yeah. same time the attributes of these forms still came through and when you look at the tales from whether it's even the UK or Wales or Scotland or yeah. you know the, the Celtic countries as well as Wentz show lots of the figures are very very similar so that's, mm -hmm. that's interesting is it just that you you then come up against that barrier of like 
well, hang on, are, are they obeying geographic rules? Or if, if, like, why, why would they do that if they're outside of it? So it's, they're that kind of conundrum as well, I suppose. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's extraordinary. And, and like, um, like I think about like, like a lot of my my kind of research into into to the gin, um, kind of over the last whatever it is, um, eight or ten years, it, it brought me back to to Ireland in a, in a big way, you know. Um, and one of the things that's is fascinating is that there's a great book called um, um, Living with Gins by Dr. Bri- Barbara Drysdens, if I'm pronouncing her surname correctly, but it's an anthropological study of kind of like the the of um living with um, a family that she married into in Cairo um, and kind of some of their beliefs and had had a kind of gin factor in, in things to a degree. Um, and that description you gave of, of someone on the outskirts of Dublin kind of like warning, uh, one of the fairies where they, they throw water out. There's a story in that book, which is um, her auntie is like, a, or a friend of her auntie, you know, there's always a bit removed right um was working late at night which is considered a taboo anyway uh cleaning late at night in the house was considered a bit of a taboo mm-hmm. and through the kind of the the, the 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 mop bucket water out the front um and as she did so she she saw a dog she threw it at the dog right um and then she was struck down blind and then eventually mm-hmm. he was praying over and she started to see the dog with the image of the dog was kind of burned into her mind's eye and um eventually she, um the, the the kind of the the gin magic was reversed, but she began to think that the dark the black dog was the gin. Um, and I was back, uh, I was back in Mayo uh, a couple of years ago, and I found a paper cutting in the Western People, uh, and I was talking about kind of Irish fairy lore, but it gave a case of a woman in Mayo who um had thrown water out without giving the the correct you know, um, warning, yeah, yeah, warning and preventative saying, which is like something in Irish of like, you know, Ishka Salak, a chalk, move, move, you know, this kind of thing. And, um, and she did, she hit, she had uh, the fairies cursed her, she hit a fairy, injured them, and, and then, um, her face was reversed, you know, the, the back of her head. And then, uh, right, right. I can't remember if she, if she was. <laughs> recovered from that but but you know it's one of those things where like you know we talk about kind of geographical distance in in ireland being kind of a barrier where here you have cairo you know you're yeah, cairo, yeah. cairo and mayo talking essentially about the same thing you yeah know? yeah um well and then there's the interesting thing i'm talking about fairies in cities and gin are walking around there you go cairo, yeah, yeah. So, and and isn't it interesting that that um idea of reversal can also be used to cure or, or, or to break yeah, a fairy yeah, spell yeah, because yeah. you know if you get caught up in the fairy mist for example one of yeah. the fairy mist is this mist that descends and uh, some people say it's it's almost like a, a passageway to the other world you might never mm-hmm. find your way back but the idea was that if you were to reverse your jacket or sometimes all <laughs> of your clothing that would break the fairy spell you know yeah. so that that motif of reversal tends to pop up in all kinds of interesting ways, as you, as you were saying about the, the, the puck as well, puka, you have that reversal, um, and you have it here, but, but used differently. It's almost like it's this particular key that can unlock different doors. Sometimes the door will lead you to an even worse situation, but sometimes it will be Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... In in your your show with uh, with Douglas in, in what magic with this um you had a wonderful expression which I think Douglas picked up on which was um called the fairies essentially were like Irish senubites or or um, oh, some, yeah. something to 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 that effect um what made you what made you think that like um I mean apart from everything they've done but um <laughs> well I like it. it anyway and he has a huge knowledge of folklore and fairy dog from around the world so i would say he 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 knew what he was doing making cenobites what they are cenobites are these demons if you like <clears throat> that people summon they they have in in the movie hellraiser they you get this magic box and you uh un- unlock it in a certain way and they come to you and they will give you your 
your your your wish, but there's always a terrible price to pay, of course. And they they have that trickster nature as well because what they say may be literally you may you might make an assumption about it, but when you look at the words, there there will have been something in there that tripped you up and you, you didn't know, and suddenly you're theirs forever. And that's very very much like you know some of the encounters with with fairies. So for me, I was like trying to make the point that you can't just think about in Irish folklore, in authentic Irish folklore, the fairies are more like Cenobites than Tinkerbell. And that was just to show that, you know, there's danger here. There's mm-hmm. lots of stories where people come out, you know, dead. Like the, the story I mentioned about the, the woman who put her sheets on the fairy board, yeah. for example. You know, but you can find lots of stories like that. Um, there was a, a person who lived close by here and she was telling me a story. It's one of these stories that she hadn't told anyone before because she was just, but um it was about her father. And one of the local fairy forts, the rumor was that there was treasure in it. Wow. And when he was a young man, it, things were hard for him and he decided that he was gonna go up and just see, for example, if yeah. the if, if he could find it. So he went up anyway and he was digging away and at one point he looked up and there were crows every, everywhere and he, but he was getting scratched and so on by the, the bushes and he couldn't find the entrance to the fairy fort. So he went home and then that evening he began to bleed from his no, from his eyes and he was bleeding all night and that was his warning if you like to, to not do that again. Yeah. But it's another one of those situations where you go to this place uh, you're, it's taboo to do it and there was a punishment. Now in a way he he got away lightly based on some of this the, the fairy anecdotes that you hear, but still the family didn't talk about it. And this woman was she's an elderly lady. Now. She didn't talk about it, but she she heard that I write about fairy stories. So, so she wanted to tell me about what happened. So there's yeah. that authenticity about it as well. So you know, I, I just do think that people often underestimate the danger. Yeah, yeah. No, that that's that's really lovely. That's it's really lovely. And it's a it's a beautiful way to to I think um encapsulate the modern it, it coming up against this phenomenon, you know, it really is. Yeah. I, yeah. What David, it's been tremendous chatting to you, you know, as I said. Yeah, been it's been a, great. And you know, we we could go on for hours, I know, but <laughs> it's it's, it's one, one of those one of those subjects. I'll put you on the spot now, um, while people are listening. We, you'll come back on again, will you? Oh, of course I will. Of course I will. I'm, I, you know what? I'm sure I, when I turn off the the lap, or the tablet now, and yeah. I'll go. Oh, I never mentioned this, or I never mentioned that. And <laughs> you know, it's just one of those things. Yeah, so, yeah there, there will be loads more to talk about. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So, so you can find me on Facebook with Circle Stories, and then of course the Cult Book Review is just um, it's on Twitter, and it's basically just me uh, promoting new yeah. occult books that I'm interested in and that yeah. publishers send me. There's no real interaction other than that, but it's a good place to go if you want to find out find out what's being released. Yeah. Do you know? Um other than that, yeah, Circle Stories on Facebook is, is the best place Lovely. to find me. Well David, it's been it's been a real pleasure. Um and uh I have to I have to thank um old um Douglas Bachelor as well. Because um I think it was the, yeah. the last time Wait, we Douglas on. is great. Yeah, he did say to me, we, you need to catch up with, with, with David. He'd love to listen to it. So he's, 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 he's a good man and, and he's, he's yeah. really wrong. So it's good to catch up and uh, inspire the show. So absolutely been fantastic. I've really enjoyed this conversation. And, and, yeah, uh, and best best of luck with your own book launch. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, it's it's a couple of months away now. I think it's, yeah. it's six months. It's, it's, I, yeah. I shouldn't talk shit too much on my own. My own podcast was taken ages. <laughs> I finished this ages ago. Like, you know. no, it's brilliant. I'm looking forward to reading it again because even though I read the manuscript, I'd like to have the yeah. physical book yeah. now and I'm going to get it myself and, and have it. And I'll put it on a cult book review. Of that would be really kind of you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure and yeah. um, let's catch up soon. Yeah. All the best for 24 there. You I'll too. Talk to you. you too. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.
wonderful wonderful stuff um that was that was great i really enjoyed that and i'm sure uh, we'll have david back on the show in in the future uh, i think there's a lot more areas uh, for us to explore and discuss um and we leave it there we leave it there take care talk soon bye Thank you.